without further ado this is crime time once again this is a jcs criminal psychology video there's a lot of uh, different sensitive topics that will be discussed during this but as somebody with a criminology major i'm fascinated by this sort of material if this is something that bothers you a lot um and you find yourself getting squeamish you're more than welcome to exit the stream for a temporary period also i do not think there are captions for this one either very very sorry but i'm sure anything super important you will provide some captions also don't freak out it is muted on purpose apparently there is music currently and uh i don't want to get in trouble again Can i just skip this part is this just like a, this is just Las Vegas, right? There's mini Paris. This is Las Vegas, right? I'm just going to skip this bitch. Who cares? I do alpha female shit. I do alpha male shit. Early morning hours of August 8th, 2014, a trail of blood marked a path down the quiet street of Pueblo Way in Las Vegas, Nevada. Pueblo. It would veer off into the National Golf Course and then make an incurve back toward each residence along the way, leaving bloody footprints in the backyard deckings and bloody palm prints on the windows, eventually culminating at the kitchen door of the very last house at the end of the street. The occupant of that household would awaken to a bang on the window, accompanied by a blood-curdling scream. The distressing noise would prompt them to immediately call 911, yet the frightening sight of what they saw when they looked outside would prevent them from opening the door. Curled up on the floor would be the horrific consequence of so-called toxic love and the conclusion of a tragic tale rampant with abuse of power and control. To fully acquire an understanding of this moment, we must take into account each of the bizarre circumstances that occurred beforehand. And that takes us back to the very beginning of this story. I don't know, man. If anybody gets in my face, obviously you can't hit them, right? Or you're off the show? You'll use your best judgment. Oh, okay. There are consequences for everything. Okay. And you'll use your best judgment. All right, what if it's self-defense? Use your best judgment. Knock them out, yeah. Third round, yeah. Knee. Where You're insane. It? See, he's insane. This one is... Uh, good. Knock, insane. knock, you know. Where was yeah. it? Who, where was it? Who San play? Manuel, Mike Robles. Mexican guy, he thinks he's all the shit, but, you know, I put him in his place. This morning, I already went to the gym at 545. I was hoping I could get a second trip today, you know, so... But I've been shadow boxing in the, in the bathroom, so... Are you a good fighter? Of course, that's why I fight. If I wasn't good, I would have fucking quit. You gotta muscle up a little bit, though. Yeah? You seem a little bit soft. All these guys are coming in all... Yeah, all but, you know, I got six inches of reach on them. All right. You'll be able to use it? Probably not. Yeah. I mean, we'll see. We'll, we'll, I mean, what are they going to take me down? Yeah. I mean, that's okay. That's what they're going to do. That's okay. They're going to take you down and beat your face in. What's all over your tent? What are all those tents mean? Like? Anarchy. Game bred, that means I was born. I'm bred to fight, never quit. That's a long story. That's a long story? <laughs> yeah. You're peeking through keyholes at naked women? What is that? No, nah, she's little. She's only like eight, probably 12 or something. She's praying. Got me some impaled people. So I like them. When I was a little kid, I saw that movie, uh, Dracula. Yeah. And the impaled bodies in it. Got me excited, so. Yeah, that's where Vlad the Impaler comes too. from. Yeah. It says War Machine, that's my fight name. War Machine? Yeah. John War Machine Copenhaver? Yeah. These were the audition tapes for season six of The Ultimate Fighter. For those of you unfamiliar with the program, the basic premise is similar to the genre of reality TV. 
You have a group of total strangers confined to a relatively small living space, multiple cameras to film each and every development that might occur, and all external sources of stimulation are taken away without exception. This means no phone, no TV, and absolutely no communication with the outside world. The simple reasoning behind this is to create tension, as tension can lead to hostility, and hostility can make for great television. I want to go. But what if you I want to go on Friday now. That is it. I don't want to be here anymore. I do not want to be here. Mum, Stuart, I'm sorry. I'm tired. Sorry. I don't want to be Stuart, around Stuart, people. Stuart. They can't give a fucking shit about how I'm feeling. I hope the public wrote me out because I don't want to be here. I fucking hate it. I fucking hate living with these two-faced <laughs> And because this I happening. don't The only real difference between the more mainstream reality shows such as Big Brother compared to the considerably more target-marketed Ultimate Fighter wow. is that the participants are solely made up of professional MMA fighters. Not only that, but they are each put into a single elimination tournament in which they must compete against each other, with the winning prize being a six-figure contract with the UFC, the world's leading MMA promotion. To put in simpler terms, 16 guys live in a house together for six weeks, and they all fight in a cage every few days until just one victor remains. That's the entire show Point. in a nutshell. So it would come as no surprise that some of the characters that voluntarily put themselves in this situation aren't exactly the most mentally stable of individuals. Especially now, dog! Straight up! I will knock you the out right What's now! What's the word? It ain't the word, dog! Oh. 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 What are you talking about? Just on a quick side note, it really is a shame the producers decided to put pretentious and dramatic music over this segment, as it somewhat takes away from the unintentional comedic brilliance of the moment. That's too soft. It's characters like this, of which there have been many, that have made the show one of the most popular in the world among the 18 to 25 male demographic. The program can make anyone a viral sensation for both the right and wrong reasons. Heroes and villains alike have become superstars of the UFC via this route of indoctrination, one of whom was 26-year-old John Copenhaver, a.k.a. War Machine, who st What did he mean by let me bang? Is is there a UFC term that means that, or is it what I think it means? Did he mean like punch the wall or? I will just let him started bang. off the show as one of the least popular contestants. His first few segments of airtime consisted of him either getting drunk, destroying property, fighting with other contestants, or making crude and indelicate remarks over a multitude of sensitive topics. He acted in a brash and somewhat primitive manner throughout the first half of the series, yet he managed to turn things around in episode 8, as he finally opened up and bared his soul in the lead-up segment to his fight, the least the to the most popular fighter over the course of a single episode. And although he lost his fight via close decision and was eliminated in the first round, he remained a favorite from that moment on, and was even given a second chance at the show's pay-per-view final where he faced off against another popular contestant. The f Sorry, they even threw on sub. Uh, I'm shocked that somebody with an early childhood trauma might be doing something bad later on. Not that everybody that deals with that sort of thing does, but you tend to see people who commit like gruesome gruesome things like what is clearly being led up to um you tend to see that they always have some form of mental or physical trauma early on in their life that they never were capable of handling spooky they've got the 60 months prime fight essentially guaranteed the winner a place in the ufc and losing in the show could now be redeemed for one of them but they needed to win and win in spectacular Hurry, fashion prime. wait UFC fight gets a tag graphic with some blood. Music plays over it. Do we think this is good music? Saturday, you're the six months. Not risking it. Nope, not risking it.
Zelda, thank you for the gifted. UFC is weird, dude. I don't think it's worth the risk. We're just gonna, we're just gonna pause. It doesn't look like John's doing so hot. It does not look like John's doing so hot. Is this the point is that he didn't? It's almost the, it's almost done. Looking like John's having a, uh... oh. Yo? John Copenhaver wins! What a fight! War Machine! The fight game is closely associated with the notion of mountaintops and valleys. The highs are so incredibly high, yet the lows are equally as low. And this requires an all-or-nothing approach to life. To win it all, you have to risk it all. Imagine training for months on end up. for an occasion that lasts 15 minutes months. at the most, and the outcome of that occasion means everything. If you win, there won't be many things that compare to the elation of that moment. But if you lose, the emotional pain can be devastating, and many have correlated the feelings with total despair and hopelessness. The fight game is essentially a complete gamble, not Man, just a from kick. a physical and financial standpoint, but from a psychological and what some would consider a spiritual one too. To be great, you must take great risks, oh my and the long-term <laughs> odds will be heavily stacked <laughs> the fucking, against you. The John fucking walk, dude. John reached the mountaintop on this occasion, yet his descent Spooky, into the valley the would soon follow. His next fight took place on May 24th of 2008, and he was submitted just 56 seconds into the first round. He was released from the UFC and Wait. had multi submitted just. His next fight took place on May 24th of 2008, and he was submitted just 56 seconds into the first round. He was released from the UFC and had multiple run-ins with the law soon after. He was eventually charged with two counts of assault, the first of which was for choking a man unconscious in a parking lot. To have that image out there that a fighter is choking people out is scary. Well, but that's nice to choke him out, because if we wanted to, we could smash their whole body apart. So a choke is nice and quiet, nice and peaceful. You take a little nap and you wake up, you know how I'm done. You know, on the, on the other hand, you smash from the pieces, and they, you know, they really hurt, so that's a nice way out. The second assault charge was for one. rendering a bouncer unconscious at a nightclub. There's always a little bit of tension between us. He's a big dude, about like 6'4", 320 pounds, big giant dude. And that night in particular, uh, we had words that kept escalating. You know, he was going to beat me up, I was going to beat him up. We're talking shit, talking shit, talking shit. And eventually it got to the point where it's like, oh, what's up? And he's like, what's up? You know, do something. He's telling me to do something, do something. Egging me on, egging me on, egging me on. Kind of challenging me. You want to fight? Well, dude, you don't want to fight me. So, yeah, come on, let's do it. Come on, let's do it. We did it. He lost. It was only one punch. I didn't, you know, I didn't terrorize him. One punch. He lost. I won. I got in trouble. Had I lost, I would have went home, went to sleep, woke up and said, I'm not going to do that again. Some people are a little bit different. They like to pick fights and then they like to, you know, call the cops, so... You know, that, that's his problem. In a surprising display of leniency from the court, he was only sentenced to three years probation with 30 days of community service. He knew he was extremely lucky not to get jail time, and this allowed him to High resume his career here, yeah. in MMA. And I'm not going to lie. I don't like the fact that he's, like, randomly getting into fights, but also, like, if what he says is true and that dude, like, straight up started it and told him to start the fight and then he got his ass kicked and called the cops, I mean... Kind of a crybaby at that point, huh? You did ask for it. What does probation mean? Um, probation is a... It's like getting punished for what you did, but you're not being put in prison. It's like you're being on... Sup yeah, you're being supervised. What the person put in chat just now. It's supervision. So there's officers who are, there's probation officers and um, they basically check in on you and make sure you're doing correct steps to rehabilitate to not commit crime again. Yeah. 
excuse me. Uh, a lot of people who leave jail get probation afterwards. Some people like this guy have uh, just go and have probation. Don't go to jail in general, etc. You know what I mean? An attempt to rise once more. He openly stated that his plan was to fight in small town shows against low level opponents in the hope that a long winning streak and improved record would allow him to return to the UFC. He had a clear cut goal, along with the blueprints on how to get there, and everything started going according to plan. More music fun. All this fun music. God, it's sure fun. It's sure fun to 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 watch all this with nothing. 24 fanhouse.com being joined by MMA fighter War Machine and War Machine you are on an impressive three fight winning streak as of late you feeling uh, a little more comfortable in your MMA career now uh you know what dude it's uh you know I belong in the big shows you know what I mean so I, I've been going around you know uh, beating up these you know undefeated hometown heroes like uh De Lorenzi up in Canada and uh Rashad Woods on D in DC and uh I mean uh these are just guys that uh that uh, I sh I'm supposed to be, you know what I mean? I mean, I'm the real deal, dude. You know, uh, I'm not a I'm not a scrub, so I'm just uh, you know, I'm just gonna keep keep on kicking ass until I uh, get back into the UFC or back into a big show. At this moment in time, the UFC required okay. a six to one win to loss ratio to even be considered for a contract. This meant John had to win three more fights to get another shot. He would win the next two, one by submission and the other by technical knockout. But kill then the lose that, the third that via him. a close spot him, huh? split decision. This loss would have been a very hard pill to swallow, as it essentially meant he would have to start from scratch. Not quite at the bottom, but not far from it. The momentum he had built was now gone despite all the work it took to get there. It would have been a remarkably harsh dose of reality when he woke up the next morning, and he appeared to go off the rails soon after. Prosecutors played surveillance video from in and outside Thruster's Lounge in Pacific Beach. It immediately knocked me back. I. I grabbed from my mouth and kind of fell backwards on, onto my, my butt. And it took me a few seconds to, to kind of come out of my daze. Bouncer Matthew Compton said the UFC fighter War Machine, uh, who had his name legally changed from John Copenhaver, punched him several times in the mouth. Compton said he was dazed. His lip was Wait. and He changed his name to War Machine? Two of his fighter war to kind of come out of my days. Bouncer Matthew Compton said the UFC fighter War Machine, uh, who had his name legally changed from John Copenhaver, punched him several times in the mouth. Compton said he was dazed, his lip was split, and two of his teeth loosened. Seconds later, he said the brawl moved outside where another security camera captured the action. Beyond aggressive. Uh, 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 crazy almost. That's the best way I can describe it. Just he was seeing nothing else. He was rendered a term of one year to be served at the San Diego County Jail, but was granted a two month delay before starting his sentence. He reportedly used this time to mainly go out and party, but also managed to cram in one final fight just days before his surrender date. Had a tough battle with John Alessio. Match didn't go your way. Care to reflect on it? Uh, you know, uh, I actually did a lot better than I thought I was gonna do. I, uh, I pretty much knew I would lose it unless I got a lucky knockout. I uh, trained for five days for the fight. I'm in the worst shape I've ever been in my whole life. <laughs> but I was like, oh man, it was a weird uh, mental game going to this fight. Usually I'm confident I think I'm going to win. This time I really knew I would lose, but I was just hoping for a lucky something. So uh, I did better than I thought I was going to do, so I'm happy for that. But I still would have you know, rather won, of course. But Now I know you've had a lot of drama uh, coming up and stuff like that. Did that at all get in your head for this fight? Yeah, I mean, sure. You know, uh, you know fighting is a, a mental game, so... You want to always have everything going as smooth as possible before a fight. So I have a lot of stress, you know. I'm going to go to jail and, uh, for a year next week. And, uh, Tiffany, you know, I, I just don't want to go to jail because <laughs> it's going to be boring, you know. I can't train. I can't fight. I can't, I can't get laid, you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, nothing's. I can't even have delicious snacks. 
no pizza, nothing. You know not I mean? exactly. So it's gonna suck, but I mean, I'm not worried nothing else. I don't think anyone's gonna try and mess with me. I mean, I mean, if you wanted to, you could probably jail, find prison. somebody. So but... everyone there is a year or less, so they all want to go home too. So I don't expect, and I'm not in a gang, so there's no reason for people to mess with me. I'm just gonna mind my own business, read some books. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm, a, I'm sincere, do push-ups I'm, and sit I don't know if he's gonna mind his own um, business. I'm not gonna lie. To the fans out there. Uh, thanks, thanks for uh, sticking by me, and uh, you know, I'll be back in a year and. Uh, I'll be in shape and I'll have I'll do good fights. So <laughs> he was initially meant to serve exactly one year in jail, yet would go on to serve over two as the judge extended his sentence due to preceding street fights that came to light. He was made to serve a large majority of his time in solitary confinement for undisclosed reasons, and he was released directly from solitary because he's onto just the streets on October fights. 29th, 2012. He conceptualized a clothing brand during his incarceration and would launch it with a friend just days after his release. Like he Dexter. also started started a video diary on social media where he virtually admitted to taking steroids and at times came across as completely unhinged and maniacal. Oh my fucking god, I'm so fucking pissed off right now. <laughs> Dude, I've been craving a fucking Slurpee since last night. I want a Slurpee. I want a fucking Slurpee. And I, and, and I see 7-Eleven, so I go and I want to get a Slurpee. And I fill out my fucking cup and the fucking bitch who fucking works there fucking tells me that I need to take off my fucking hoodie on my head. And I was like, what? Huh? And the fucking bitch tells me that I have to fucking take off my hoodie or she's not going to fucking serve me a fucking Slurpee. Are you fucking serious? Oh my God, dude, I'm, so, I'm fucking freaked the fuck out. And then the fucking other asshole that works there says he's going to call the, the cops. This, be like... I wanna, I'm so, I want to, I'm so, I want to smash the fucking motherfucker. So I, went, so I fucking, I dumped my fucking Slurpee on the floor so those fucking dumb motherfuckers could clean it up. It's not fucking Why? worth it. Oh, you, what a weirdo. Oh my God, I'm so fucking mad. Why can't I just get a fucking Slurpee? Why Why do motherfuckers got to harass me and tell me to take off my fucking hoodie? I'm going to go to this other 7-Eleven right now. I'm going to get a fucking Slurpee right now. And these motherfuckers better not tell me to take off my fucking hoodie. And they better not give me a hard fucking time. He's First of all, it is fucking weird that he had to take off his hoodie for a fucking Slurpee. But also, like, this is like a 14-year-old getting told he can't have a piece of candy or some shit. Motherfuckers. Oh, my God. This motherfucker better not fucking tell me to take off my fucking hoodie. I'm going to snap. Oh, fucking egg. Look what I got. Slurpee. Look at my hood still on. Yeah, you know what, man? I'm fucking really glad this fucking dickhead right here, he, he sold me a Slurpee because if that motherfucker... Where are we right now? I'm uncomfortable. Wouldn't give me a Slurpee. Are we, are we by his Damn. crotch right now? What the hell is that? I had to boycott fucking 7-Eleven and all Slurpees. And I, I don't like to boycott Slurpees. What's up, guys? Yeah, I got some time to talk about this TRT shit right now. First of all, fucking any fighter that, that tries to get a TRT exemption is, is, is stupid because now you're telling them you're doing it. You know what I mean? Now like... You know what I mean? You're better off just to shut up about it. Steroids aren't magic. You know what I mean? It, most all athletes do it, and they do it because they want to be the best. They want to do the best, and plus everyone else is doing it. So it's it, it, it's like, a, what are you going to do? What are you going to do, you know? You can't do shit about it, you know? Hey, yo, fuck 24-hour fitness, man. Oh, my God, I'm fucking about to freak the fuck out. I just left my fucking workout. This fucking, so I'm working out. I'm doing fucking um, uh, weighted pull-ups, 24-hour uh, fitness. And I'm using, you know, a chalk, because I, I go heavy. Like, I'm doing like 105 pounds, and fucking it slips. You know, you see me chalk. Uh, and some of this fucking, this fucking like little fucking old skinny white fucking little bitch, this little man. I'm like, I'm like chalking my hands, and I fucking walk up. I walk up to the, uh, to the bar. He's like, he goes, hey, chalk's not allowed in this gym. And I was like, what? He's like, and I was like, I don't give a fuck. He's like, he's like, oh, you don't give a fuck? I said, I don't give a fuck. I said, get the fuck out of my way, motherfucker. And he's like, oh, I've been here for six years. I said, I don't give a fuck. I don't give a fuck. Get the fuck out of my way. Get the fuck out of my way. Get the fuck. I said, motherfucker, you better get the fuck out of my fucking way. Oh, if I wasn't on probation, I would smash his fucking face. If it was the old days, oh my God, dude. And then I'm wearing my fucking, I do alpha male shit, fucking shirt, my tank top and shit. And he's like, oh, also, your shirt has profanity. I said, motherfucker. I said, shit is not a fucking cuss word. I was like, hey man, I said, you're fucking, I said, you're taking too far, motherfucker. I said, you're taking too fucking far. 
I said, I'm gonna freak the fuck out. Get the fuck out of my fucking face. I said, I'm gonna finish your fucking workout. And then I'm yes, gonna fucking it is. Get the fuck out of my face. I'm, I'm gonna freak. I'm gonna snap. I'm gonna snap. Oh, yeah. So I, I go down uh, downstairs to check out. And I tell the chick, like, hey, where's your little bitch ass manager? <laughs> and she looked at me all crazy. And then, I, and then I went into the manager's office. She's like, oh, I'm really sorry. I was like, I don't give a fuck. I said, get the fuck out of my fucking face right fucking now. I don't give a fuck. I don't give a fuck. Get the fuck out of my face. Don't talk to me again in your fucking life. Oh, my God, dude. I'm fucking pissed. Oh, hey, go to alphamilshit.com and buy some shit. Just fucking, why not? Because it's good shit. <laughs> it is. This guy just tell everybody to get out of his face even once he, like, goes out guy. to go and talk to you? Hey, I was watching the, the video from last night. And I was freaking out about that. Uh, 24 hour fitness stuff. <laughs> he's, he's, he's reacting he's to his own video. <laughs> but I was fucking pissed, for real. I'm on probation <laughs> and, you know, uh, uh, you know, I, I can't act the way I, that I used to act, you know, like a, like a wild maniac, like I want to, you know, like, so I think this is going to be kind of good, like the, the stupid, um, his little video blogs, because then, you know, I could like kind of vent, you know, it's kind of like a diary, like a journal or whatever, I don't have to freak out and, and smash people instead, you know, it's kind of good, and it's, it's kind of funny, you know, because <clears throat> uh, when I watch it, when I watch it, uh, I'm like, fuck, dude, I look like a fucking psychomaniac. But that's all I get, man. I get so fucking pissed off, you know? So What is this off. angle, dude? But that guy was a dick, though. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what that guy's problem was. He was highly active on social media, and his intense, albeit controversial now? views seemed to recapture his fan base to a considerable degree. For the first six months after his release from prison, rather than training to be a professional fighter, he mainly vlogged and focused on his brand, while posting the majority of his content to MySpace. Every day he would post a fresh cover photo without exception, In like 2012? and each image consisted of a scenic background with an inspirational message glazed over it. This became almost habitual activity, and those who were following John's account could expect a new picture at around midnight every night. However, on Tuesday the 9th of April 2013, the routine procedure abruptly ceased, and for four days, his social media went completely silent. On Sunday the 14th, he would post just one cover photo, but then withdrew completely from all social media platforms. If the love doesn't feel like 80s reggae, then I don't want it. Am I missing a reference of something here, or is he just really into reggae from the 80s? Also, why is he still using MySpace in 2013? I have so many questions. ...for almost two weeks. This caused both his followers and the MMA community to speculate on his whereabouts, with many asserting he had gone back to prison for violating his parole, while others stated he was on the run for a drug charge. But he wasn't on the run, and he wasn't in prison. The rumors were quashed on Friday the 26th at exactly 4.34 p.m., as John's social media would once again come alive and see him post multiple times a day, every day. Only this time he wasn't posting melodramatic quotes lifted from Google Images. Uh -oh. As it appeared, he no longer... Is this supposed to be 80s reggae music? Two-year-old Christy McInday was a figure in the adult field. She rose to stardom in 2012 when she first began as a performer, and her profile continued to skyrocket as she hit the mainstream avenues. Her and Copenhaver met on a Hustler magazine during the. I can't fucking uh, uh, relationship two weeks later. John went back to I fighting and restored this? his winning streak. While Christy continued to rise in the world of adult entertainment, they adult both seemed to elevate each other's profiles simultaneously. And this is a public star? appearances at award ceremonies and media.
What is happening? Receiving brand deals as a couple. I muted and for even like in two. talks with Bravo TV about starting their own reality show. I muted They're for like 30 seconds. Appeared to align there are not captions and I, I can't have, promising. I can't Yet find the captions. Bright outlook they don't have captions flourishing on. careers and the prospect of being famous would fade into trivial insignificance when compared to the extraordinary Oops. rush of falling in love. Here's just like straight music apparently, so Oh. What goes often in the abuse, extremely common in abusive relationships, and will alter the reality when no one is watching. This is extremely common in abusive relationships, oh. and will often be an unspoken agreement between the abused and the abuser. They will each maintain the pleasing facade while hiding the ugly truth. The abuser's public There's image will often one be soon. an be contradiction to their true self, while the abused will happily play along as they can escape into fantasy and pretend it's all real for a few brief moments. A prolonged abusive relationship requires both parties to live vicariously mm. through the perceptions of others. It would come to light that violence was a common occurrence in Christy and John's relationship, with Christy being on the receiving end of it each and every time. She would eventually break break things off in May 2014, but John kept a key to her apartment and showed up unannounced three months later to find her in bed with another man. That man was 35-year-old Corey Thomas, who was then beaten to a bloody pulp for roughly 10 minutes and suffered a dislocated shoulder, broken nose, and bite mark to the face. He was then put in a chokehold and made to swear that he wouldn't go to the authorities, at which point he gave John his word and was then let go. Copenhaver then set himself on Christy for almost two hours. She was raped, severely beaten, and cut with a knife. Her injuries included 18 broken bones in her face, 12 missing teeth, three rib fractures, and a severely ruptured liver. Once her attacker's back was oh turned, she God. managed to escape out the balcony and stagger to a neighbor's garden where she was soon rescued by police. Officers then raided the apartment, but Copenhaver was nowhere to be found. He went on the run for over a week and posted tweets the entire time, basically professing how misunderstood and unfairly treated he was. He was eventually tracked down to a motel in Simi Valley, California and taken into custody. He was held without bond at the Clark County Detention Center for two and a half years awaiting trial. He pleaded not guilty to all 34 charges laid against him, which included 34? one count of first-degree rape and two counts of attempted murder. His trial commenced on February 27th of 2017. Holy. Now, you will hear that all of a sudden while they're sleeping, this door comes open, the lights turn on, and the defendant is standing there. Both of them are shocked. They both kind of sit up in That's the bed. That's fucked, bro. The defendant looks at Corey. He what runs a freak. to Corey. He jumps on the bed and he starts wailing on his face. Hit after hit after hit after hit. Corey sticks up his hand to protect himself. What an absolute himself. freak to keep the key the for that long and just show up in for three months. In Chris three months. Knowing that this is what the defendant does, very quickly hops out of bed and puts the two dogs out because the defendant has been violent towards her dogs in the past. She puts those dogs out. She then runs to the bathroom, she takes her cell phone, and she makes a 911 call. Oh my... I, I don't want to hear that. I do not want to hear that. Mm-mm. tell you that at one point she wakes up she's lying on her back her legs are spread out in front of the defendant excuse my language and he says pussy i'm gonna take it back he then licks his hand places it on her vagina in an attempt to lubricate it as he tries to get himself hard but he's not able to do so and that makes him angry so he continues to beat her ladies and gentlemen at the end of this trial after you see all of the items of evidence, after you hear the testimony of Corey Thomas, and after you hear the uh. testimony of Christine McIntyre, uh. the state will ask you to go in, deliberate, come back, and find the defendant guilty 
of the crimes in which the state has charged him. I want to ask you a couple questions about an individual by the name of Christine McIndoe. Do you know her? Yes. And how is it that you know her? Uh, we dated. Tell me about that first date. How did it go? Went great. We met each other and you know, got acquainted with each other and had some dinner about 7 p.m. Did you um, discuss any of her previous boyfriends at that time? Yeah, you kind of discussed that, you know, in, in the beginning of opening day. And we did give, like, a big domestic her, her violence warning before this. Uh, what was your understanding of her relationship with the MMA fighter previous boyfriend? Oh, she said they had no relationship. They'd been over for six months. So then the door opened uh, to the room, and the lights came on, and the defendant was standing there looking at me. Is that individual present in the courtroom today? Yes. Can you point to him and describe something he's wearing? Oh, sure. Purple shirt, war machine. So the lights went on at that time, and then you were able to see his face? Yeah. Describe to me the expression on his face. A very surprised, big-eyed, um, very angry look, and could see him say the words, what the fuck. What happens after he mouths those words to you? So I um, thought to myself, wow, what's, what's going to happen next? And I remember trying to put my hands onto the bed and kind of slide to, up to, towards the sitting position. But before I could get there, he had already jumped onto the bed from there to there, and he had started pounding me in the face. And where was he striking you? In the face. With what? With his knuckles, closed fist. Um, did he land any of those hits? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, what's going through your mind at this time? Uh, cover my face, but um, then I was just receiving hits right to the face, probably 10, 15 good, fast. What quick is this hits. cameraman doing? And I just covered, I started to cover my face as fast as possible and get my hands up. What's this guy's haircut, dude? In. What you the know, fuck? I mean, the guy's a fighter, so it's like you can't cover everything. and. Um, I thought to myself, okay, I gotta break him from hitting me. And I reached up, I grabbed him behind the neck with my right hand, and I pulled him down to flatten him out so he had to just put his hands out. Though as he's coming down, then he bit me here in the cheek. This one went real fucking out, out there, like real fast. I don't think I could have given enough of a warning. I mean, I, I, mean, I had no idea. The whole point is I react to these with you, but I... I mean, Jesus, dude. Yeah, I might, I might periodically. I, I, I don't know, dude. I can't handle like a a nine one one call. Like, I can't handle that. I don't like that. I don't like. I understand it's necessary to to emphasize the gravitas of the situation or to emphasize to the jury what the the true emotions that were happening at the time. But I just don't. I I personally don't want that. I don't. I don't think genuine nine one one calls really make my skin crawl, and in, in 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 a really, yeah, not something I I love hearing. That like that other case when you could like hear the dad. No, don't want that. Put his hands out though as he's coming down, and he bit me here in the cheek. Okay. And I could feel the bite, and once it registered, I was getting bitten. Then I put my hands back up to try and break him off of my face, and then he bit me in the arm. Bit him? What a fucking freak, dude. And then he's still hitting me, um, slipping in a lot, a lot of hits. So um, I used my feet and my hands to push him away from me, and I stepped off to the left side of the bed. I tried to roll over to the, to the side of the bed, and then he came lunging at me and immediately went for my neck from behind and put a choke <coughs> on my neck. Uh, my head is about here, body's like this. He's choking me that Why is there way? so many and papers flipping? Can we talk papers, about this? So Why do we... Oh there's so many, like, I'm papers in the background. What were you feeling uh, as he's choking you? I was starting to see stars and go unconscious. It was on my way. So then I, I thought to myself, well, I'm, I'm physically done. I think the only thing left here is to mentally try and change the table and see what's, what's possible. And I just asked a simple question. I said, well, what do you want from me? Do you want to kill me, or do you want me to walk out of here? What was his response? At first, it was you know not really a response, just a just a, 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 a pause. Then he moved into threatening me and telling me, "Well, my friends are hell's angels, and my friends are Navy SEALs, and you know how do I know if I let you go, you're not going to be a snitch?" 
Did you tell him whether or not you would snitch? Yeah, I, I said, well, I'm no snitch. Oh, okay. So that's that's that. You know, if, if we make an agreement to awkward to handle this and this is over, then that's what it is. Okay. But um, he to be fair, it wasn't and, him. And and I said, well, you got really two options. You got to kill me, or you got to let me go. And I kind of tried to just change the table, and I could feel him kind of release a little bit. I got to a, my feet and walked around the bed. I grabbed my things from this side of the bed. I looked at him, he looked at me, we nodded at each other, and I said, okay, and, and I walked out the door. I went up to the other room where we were last night, grabbed the rest of my stuff, and I walked right back up, down the stairs to the front door, and left. Were you able to, um, did you land any punches on him? No. No? And why not? Because I was busy getting punched. Okay. When you were leaving Ms. Mack's residence, did you um, hear uh, any screaming or yelling between either the defendant or Ms. McIndoe? No. Uh, could you hear anything that made you believe that there was um, further violence going on in that house? From from hearing anything, no. Because in my mind, I mean, I mean, I would never, you know, that's hitting a girl is not something that I would ever be able to understand doing. So. And in my mind, Hit, what did you say? Hitting a girl. Hitting a girl. Yeah, I was raised with three three sisters, my own mom, mom, my mother, and that's not something that would process in my mind. So I thought two guys fought. That's the end of it. And you know, I'm spent. I'm sure he is. And move forward. Um. Do you have quite an affinity for animals? Yes, I do. Right. Do you, you have several pets? Yes. So during this time period that we're going to talk about in a little bit, which would be August of 2014, can you explain um, how many animals you had and you know, what kind of animal they were? Um, I have two dogs, and I had, I believe, five snakes at that time, and I had some rats, and um, John and I had shared two ferrets. Okay. Um, you said you used the term John. Uh, who's that? And you refer to him as War Machine. Okay. And was he your boyfriend at one time? Yes. Okay. Do you see him in the courtroom today? Yes, I do. Can you please um, just describe an article of clothing that he's wearing for me? He's wearing a white button-up shirt. Okay. Um, Your Honor, may the record reflect that she's identified Oh, defendant? I was like, yes, what? Thank was you. it a purple? So, New day. we were speaking about the defendant just a second ago. Careful with this part. Um, I, I mean, obviously she's going to go... What's obvious to me might not be might not be obvious to everybody. So really quick before we do this, this is the victim who is probably going to have to talk about the entirety of what what happened, including the sexual assault. So if this is something you don't want to hear, which I'm assuming some of you might not, um. I'm a little torn. I don't know if I want to hear it personally. I think just for the sake of of really I think we will watch it, and um, if I start feeling uncomfortable, we'll, we'll, we'll s skip ahead. But if you feel like you're going to be, you might not need to be here for this. But for the sake of the fact that we're doing this sort of thing, for the sake of learning about this sort of stuff that happens, and, um, you know, this is, this is something that I studied, and, and people like this need to have their voice heard a lot more than they're able to do now because we, we see issues with domestic abuse all over and people not feeling like they're able to speak out about it. And I think it might be healthy for me to expose myself to this sort of thing just to be more understanding personally. So if I start to get uncomfortable, we might skip ahead. 
this is the pause. I'm warning you. This she's going to recount the sexual assault that happened to her. So met him. Um, we met at an adult shoot for Hustler, um, and it was just a it was just a like a photograph spread for Hustler magazine. Was it your like? Did you have an appointment to do the photo shoot at Hustler, or did he? How did that work out? He did. They had asked him to do the shoot, and he said I would only do it if you got Christy to do it. Okay. Did you know him at that point? No, I did not. Okay. Um, and so you agreed to do the shoot? Yes. And so um, the two of you obviously must have hit it off. Wait, so this asshole um, requested yeah, her to show bit. up? Um, I was Ew. very standoffish. Um, I didn't want a relationship. I was very, Gross. I felt very independent and I didn't want a man at that time. Okay. Um, but at some point you came into a relationship, right? Yes, we did. And so when was that? Um, just a few weeks after. Yeah, get uncomfortable, you fucking asshole. When you started dating, how old were you? What a fucking baby, dude. 32. And how old was he? That would make him 32. What types of how things fucking dare you do that when shit. the relationship was going well? What types of things did the two of you do for fun? Um, we would go to movies. We would just go to the park, drive around sometimes. Um, I don't like being in crowds. Um, I have really bad social anxiety, so it makes me uncomfortable. Um, and I was going to ask you, are you somewhat of a, a homebody? Yes, definitely. Um, and do you drink? Not at all. Do you do any drugs? Never. Um, and so, Mr. Copenhaver, did he, did that lifestyle match with him as well? Um, for a while it seemed that it did, but at times it definitely did not suit him at all. If I were to ask you, like, how would you explain your relationship? What would you say? Um, our relationship was definitely very, very passionate. Um, and at times very violent but sometimes extremely loving. Did the defendant go quickly to anger um, during the fights? Um, usually, yes. Um, at some point in your relationship, did, did you start to see an angry side of him? This dude yes, better get a life. He definitely doesn't have one anymore. In the beginning, There's no way he's not out of jail right now. Him, um, this happened in 2014. The There's no way he's out not of jail. In the beginning. Okay, can you explain the, how it was? Um, in the beginning, he would remove himself from the situation. Did it get to a point um, where when he got angry, he wasn't leaving the room anymore? Yes. Um, and did there start to become physical violence in your relationship? Yes, there did. When, when did that start happening? Um, I want to say three or four months in. In the beginning, it would just be like a slap in the face, and that would be it, or just choking me, and that would be it. When he would do this, was your breathing impeded? Yes, it was. Um, would you like see stars or lose consciousness? Usually, yes. Usually you would lose consciousness? Yes. How often were these types of things happening, like the slaps or the chokes? At first, they, they weren't that frequent, maybe once a month. Um, but as our relationship progressed, the violence progressed also. I cannot believe she's up here saying all that. Um, That's amazing. Did you ever fight back? I don't no. know if I'd be able to no, without your mom lives breaking with down, you in your especially home if that house person would be in that she, same fucking room. And you said that the defendant hated your mom. Yes. And was there a constant, um, I mean, it, it went both ways. Is that fair to say? Yes, it did. They, they mm. both hated each other. When he would do these things to you, like these choking events or slapping events, um, would he ever take any personal property from you? He would usually take my phone. And why would he take your phone? He was afraid that I was going to call my mom. Why would that scare him if you called your mom? Because my mom would call the police. Did you feel comfortable telling your mom or your friends that these types of things were happening to you? No, um, I hid it from my mom the best I could. Um, I don't like my mom to worry about me, and then I also didn't want her to call the police. Were you, were you embarrassed that these things were happening to you? I was extremely embarrassed. I never thought that I could let that happen to me. Um, I always saw myself as a strong individual, and um, I realize now that I shouldn't have been embarrassed, but at the time I definitely was. Did he ever threaten you if you did tell? Yes, he did. What did he say? Um, he, would, he said he would send his Navy SEAL friends and the Hells Angels after 
either myself or my family if he went to if he went to prison. Christie recounts four graphic occurrences of her getting physically assaulted by the defendant, with the fourth being over another guy designing her gold-plated fangs. He he ripped my wig off, and I took my fangs out because I knew he was going to hit me next. Fangs. And I didn't wow. want to either chip my Kinda teeth sick. or swallow one of the fangs. Okay. So you took them out. What yes. happened after you took the fangs out? Um, I put them into my bag. And he began screaming at me more and more, and he turned the car around to go back where we came from. I had taken my seatbelt off because I knew if we hit a stoplight, I'd be able to escape and I wouldn't have to get hit this time. Okay. So um, I took my seatbelt off without him noticing, and I tried. When we reached the stoplight, thank God we hit, we hit a stoplight, I opened the door to try and escape, and he pulled me back in by my hair and slammed my head down on the dashboard which chipped my tooth. And then he was still really mad, so he grabbed my head and brought me in and bit my chin right here. In the left part of your bottom chin? Yes. And, uh, and I don't remember how many times he hit me after that, but he turned down the side road by the Best Buy, and he said, now I have to kill you because people saw you try and escape. He said, now I have to take you to the desert and kill you. I was. St I still have my seatbelt off. I was bent over crying. What an absolute At some point, he punched degenerate. me in the back. Um, and then he took me to a gym parking lot, and he calmed down a little bit. And uh, he he licked his hand and tried to wipe some of the blood away. He told me he couldn't take me home like this because my mom was home. Um, and he told me he had to clean me up, but everything was gonna be fine. Um, and then after that, he took me home. He went inside first. Um, when my mom greeted him, she, he said that I was just, you know, um, getting some stuff out of the car and that I would be in shortly. And then when she went back to her room, he allowed me to come in and go upstairs and clean myself up. What were your injuries after that incident? Um, I, had, I had a black eye and I had a cut under my eye. I had a scratch on my nose where he had hit me. Um, I had a bite mark here. Um, and that, that's pretty much it. My chipped tooth. Um, I once told my mom, you know, I was just, I just fell down the stairs in my bedroom. Um, of course, the, the cliche, I fell down the stairs. Um, but I, I ended up using that. Um, I told my friends that you know, it was just a dog scratch or, you know, my dogs are large, that a dog had hit me in the head, Ugh. like head butted me. Like it was, I would just come up with any excuse that I could use. You said in the days afterwards, um, he would take care of you. So let's say that, you know, there's, there's an incident um, like we were just talking about, um, and then you have marks on your face. In the next days, how would he treat you? It would be the best days of our relationship. He would stay home from training just to be with me, and uh, he would, we would watch all my favorite movies. He would go to the store and get all the snacks that I wanted. He would go get coffee for me. We would order, you know, take in a delivery. Um, you should just do that shit without the whole domestic sure abuse part, you stupid okay. fuck. What a was motherfucker, dude. Extremely loving. This is known in psychology as the cycle of abuse, yeah. or more specifically, phase three, sometimes referred to as the honeymoon stage. After an abusive episode, the abuser will often seek connection. They will act romantic, apologetic, and remorseful. The abused will primarily feel relief in that they are no longer being attacked, but they may also begin to feel a stronger connection to the abuser due to the abrupt switch of contrasting emotions. When intense fear and intimidation is directly followed by affection and warmth, the intimate nature of the latter can become significantly intensified. The abused will then feel reassured and hopeful about the relationship, and this denial approves the illusion of safety. During therapy, the counselor will often refer to this as the merry-go-round. The reason for this is or because the cheerful image of an amusement ride is believed to make it less intimidating, and therefore easier to both spot and then accept when the cycle of abuse is occurring. Christy then goes on to graphically recount just one of the multiple times she was raped by the defendant. When this is going on, are you, you know, are you saying anything? Are you fighting? I start by saying, no, please don't, like, I don't want this to happen, and then I just give up. Did you make clear to him that I, I, this is not what I want? Yes, I did. I began crying at some point. Um, I tell him, stop, and then I just lay there. 
after it was done, how, how did it end? Um, he got off and then I went to the shower and just kept crying. And he started screaming at me, what the fuck's wrong with you? After this event happened, um, did you still maintain a, a relationship with him? Yes, I did. Why did you continue to stay with him when these things were being done to you? I loved him. Um, I would have done anything for him. I, I just wanted to be with him. That's awful. Another hour of testimony goes by where Christy details multiple occurrences of physical and psychological abuse. She eventually gets to the moment when Corey Thomas had just left the apartment after being assaulted by Copenhaver. Now you said that after Corey leaves you remember mm. the defendant running at you. Yes. And then you remember, the next thing you remember is being in the shower. I hope shower. this dude yes. never leaves jail, dude. Do you remember dude. how you got in the shower? I don't know how I got in the shower. Do you remember, um, when you were in the shower, did you have clothes on or off? They were off, um... And the, the shorts that I were wearing were in the shower. When you were in the shower, uh, what was the defendant doing? He was going through my phone and yelling at me through the glass door. What was he yelling about? I don't remember exactly what he was yelling about anymore. At that point in time, do you, did you think you had been hit? Yes. Um, I could taste blood in my mouth. So I knew I had been hit in the face. And I also have, I don't remember how I got in the shower. What's the next thing you remember? Um, past that, I went to, I just remember being on all fours right in front of the shower, uh, like I was about to stand up, and he kicked me in my ribs so hard that I fell over and began convulsing. Did you ever ask him for help or to stop? Just after this, um, I told him that I needed help. Cause like, I genuinely felt like I was going to die at this point. What did he say to you? He told me that nobody could help me. At any point in time, did he um, <clears throat> ever use any weapons against you? Yes, he did. Can he, you explain how? He had a knife. Um, it was one of my, my kitchen set knives. It was a black handle with silver rivets. And um, he would push it into my ear. He would push it into my hand. He sawed off my hair. Um, he cut up all of my wigs because he always hated my wigs. He, he cut my head. With the knife? Yes. And I just remember him still being so angry. He broke the handle off of the knife and still continued to use the knife blade um, in his hand to push it into me. Does, is there come a point where he tells you that he's going to have to kill you? Yes. What does he say? He looks at me and he says, now I have to kill you. I've gone too far. I, you can't be seen like this. Everyone's going to know. Copenhaver then goes downstairs to the kitchen to retrieve another blade, at which point Christy gets to her feet, staggers to her first story balcony, and jumps off. She then... Hold on, I gotta go check something in my, in my bedroom. Damn, dude, that's fucking awful. Let's take like a quick breather here. I, we're about to get started with Sea of Thieves, but uh, we'll finish the video first. Um, sorry, I had to I had to go into the uh, bedroom. Um, no, I'm good. I'm good. Um. For people that don't know, one of our dogs uh, had a tumor on her leg and they found it cancerous. Uh, they removed it and don't really see many signs of, of any remaining cancer cells, but uh, she's going through chemo just in case. So she needs to take steroids, to combat the effects of chemo, uh, but it uh, also causes her to have a short bladder that she can't really control at the time. So, funnily enough, uh, we've had to get dog diapers for her. 
So she entered the office with her diaper off. So I went to go make sure there wasn't a a, a piss diaper somewhere. There wasn't. Thankfully, I guess it just slipped off because it doesn't. There was nothing in it, but um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We got we got diapers for Piper. It's kind of it's kind of funny, but. I just needed to make sure she didn't like piss everywhere. She did not. I don't think she did. I might go double check while I'm thinking about it. All right, I'm going to play the video. I'm going to go check just in case. I'm going to double check. musters the strength to make her way down to the end of the street where her neighbor spots her hiding in the garden and calls 911. Christy was taken to the hospital and treated for her injuries. The horrific images circulated on social media and the hashtag war machine began trending in the United States, Canada, Brazil, and the United Kingdom. The mugshot of the perpetrator became the most retweeted image during the second week of August 2014 and this eventually led to his arrest. The trial was a hot topic in the national news news, with each of the elements receiving a considerable amount of coverage, yet the most talked about was Erin McIndae, Christie's mother. She would testify on day seven of the trial and manage to come across as both endearing yet intimidating at the same time. The type of person you would want as a friend, but most certainly would not want as your enemy. Just briefly, like, how would you characterize Christie? What type of child was she? She was a very quiet child. She liked to keep to herself. She was very loving. Um, she was very creative. She liked to color and draw and play with Barbies. And she. How did she do in school? She was outstanding in school. I never had to stand over her and say, do your homework. It was an automatic thing for her. Um, would you say she's an extrovert or an introvert? I would say introvert for sure. As far as you know, um, does she drink alcohol? What a, what yeah. a mom, dude. Um, or, or you can she tell she really never, gives a shit she's about never it. never had alcohol. Um, what about drugs? No. In 2013, did Christine start dating someone um, by the name of Jonathan Copenhaver? Yes. Do you see him here? I do. He's wearing a white shirt, playing oh. with his fingers. Okay. Your Honor, may the record reflect. Get his <laughs> ass, dude. Yes, Lord. Thank you. I hope she now, keeps resting uh, him. Does he look that, that'll make my day. He sits here today. No. How does he look different? He looks like he's lost about 50, 60 pounds. He's not as broad in the arms and in the shoulders. Um, did you start to see any changes in Christine after she had been with him yes. for a few months? Yes. Can you please describe some of those changes? She was more isolated from me. She didn't want to do anything with me. She would spend more time in her room. Um, she wasn't as talkative. Uh, her social media, one of her accounts was closed. She was more of an, she's always been independent. Even as a little girl, she was independent. And you could see her independence kind of slip away as time went on. Were you ever present uh, at the home when the defendant became physically violent towards your daughter? I was in that room that day, and I heard screaming and fighting. And I came out of my bedroom, and I said, what the F is going on? They're screaming at each other. I don't even, I can't even remember what they were screaming, but Christy was standing up on the stairs. I'm not sure where John was. And she said he grabbed me by my neck and drug me up the stairs. I, I, I don't know what to say about this one guy. I mean, I don't, I don't have much... I don't know. There's not really much to, to dissect here. I mean, this dude is just straight up an absolute piece of shit. And I, I don't want to even come close to pretending I can know the half of what these people are going through. There's not a lot I can really add here. And I don't, I don't want to do so and, and come off as disrespectful. I think this is just something that is, is, important for us to understand and, and realize is something that is very unfortunately a realistic situation that far too many people go through and that if you see anybody with anything coming close to this sort of issue 
or feel like somebody is being victimized in this type of manner, it, you might save a life by reaching out or at least doing your best to. I don't I don't know what else to say. I really I mean there's not in comparison to the other stuff, this is by far the most intense and awful feeling and I also can't there, there's really not anything to add. This dude is just an absolute garbage waste of a of a of a of a life. I'm in. Screaming and fighting. And I came out of my bedroom and I said, what the F is going on? They're screaming at each other. I don't even, I can't even remember what they were screaming, but Christy was standing up on the stairs. I'm not sure where John was. And she said, he grabbed me by my neck and drugged me up the stairs. And I'm like, I'm calling the police. And you could see she had a red mark on her throat. So he, she said, I, I'm sorry, when she said that to you, when she said he grabbed me by my throat, is she talking like you and I are talking or is- No, she was screaming, she was hysterical. Okay. I think at that point, John had gone up to the bedroom to pack his stuff, because when I said I'm calling the police, he, he's leaving. And he stood in the closet with his laundry bag, taking his clothes and stuffing it in there, going, I'm going to kill you, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. Was the relationship be between the defendant and you, um, it, had it pretty much deteriorated? Yes. Um, and because of that, was, was Christy often kind of in the middle between the two of you? Yes. Was it clear at this point that you didn't like him? And oh, I couldn't like stand him at that point. I didn't like him. And I, I told Christy. Can't imagine why. You know, I started noticing things and I told her my opinion and it was just she'd say I don't want to talk about it I don't want to talk about it and then at 644 um, you receive a text message from the defendant you awake yet several question marks there was a huge fight when I came in the guy she was in bed with came at me so when you start getting these text messages oh you know what do you do what's going through your mind I tried to call him because I couldn't text fast enough. I just woke up. I was trying to read those and try to process out of a straight sleep. What am I looking at? What oh, the my mind is trying to catch up to right. everything that's going on. I thought I thought John so I texted her him. this shit. And I said, "What's going on?" And he goes, "We got into a fight and I had to beat her up." And and from wait. that point on, wait, yeah, she is talking just, about that. Wait, I think I hung up the phone. I went and told my boyfriend. Wait, what did he fucking just, say? I had to beat her up and on. And he goes, we got into a fight and I had to beat her up. And and from that point on, I just, I think I hung up the phone. I went and told my boyfriend, you've got to get up now. He's done something to Christy. Move your car <laughs> so I can get across town. My boyfriend said, oh God. So did you get in your car and go across town? He moved his car and I started driving. And I think the next time uh. I had a thought, I was actually underneath the desert in the viaduct, the, the bridge on DI. Okay. Do you know what I'm talking yes, about? I, I think that's the last cognitive thought that I really had from the house to there. And my thought was, she's dead. That did, was my thought. Did you get to Christie's house? I did. And when you got there, um, were there already police officers and everything? Yes, ma'am. And what did you do? Um, I stopped my truck in the street. I got out of my truck. I saw that the front door was open. I started running. There were officers outside of the house trying to tell me to stop. There were some officers inside the house, and I made it as far as to the inside door, and it was almost like I was like face to face with a lady police officer. And um, she looked at me and I looked at her and I said, is my daughter dead? And she just looked at me and she said, no, she's at Sunrise Hospital. I get to the ER and I said, I'm Christy Max, mom, I wanna see my daughter. And they took me to her room.
And I walked in and she was laying in the bed and it didn't look like her. And I walked around and I grabbed her hand. And she said, please don't cry. So I squatted down underneath the bed so I wouldn't upset her. And I held her hand and I cried. <laughs> At, while you were speaking with Christy, um, did you attempt to help her find something that she was looking for? How could this dude yes. live with himself, what man? Her cell phone? Did you text the defendant and ask him for it? Christy told me that he had taken her cell phone. So I started sending him text messages that I wanted that fucking phone. Were you ever able to get the cell phone? No. Oh, she's glaring it at him, dude. looks to kill. According to the Journal of Neuroscience, that's a, that's the mother and murderous. daughter relationship is the strongest of all bonds. The part of the Holy brain that regulates shit. emotion is more similar between mothers and daughters than any other intergenerational pairing. And this means a mother is more able to put herself in her daughter's shoes when facing a problem, and thus empathize with her struggle to a far greater extent. Was, um, without talking about your conversations with Christy, was, were there, was there a folder on Christy's phone that she specifically wanted you to get? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> for during the remainder of Christie's stay at the hospital, and then for several weeks after, um, did you kind of try to keep her in a safe place in a, in hiding? Yes. Uh, until the defendant had been apprehended. Yes. Now you talked a little bit about uh, Christie when you came to her in the hospital and started crying. She told you to. She told you to quit crying. Um, Say yes. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. Is, I know it's hard, but I need an out loud answer. Would you consider her an emotional person? No. Do you consider it easy for her to share things? No. In regards to this incident, um, does she talk, want to talk about it? No. <coughs> because of the incidents that you've spoken about, you know, that you, you have seen the defendant physically violent, um, and because you saw your daughter with marks and you had concerns, do you regret now, you know, not stepping in and going to the police? No. Mm -mm. The other incidents that I saw, I really wish I would have shot you. That's my retrospective. Holy I I shit. She is not breaking eye contact with him either. The trial lasted three weeks, and the verdict came in on March 20th, 2017. Verdict. We, the jury in the above title case, find the defendant, War Machine, a.k.a. Jonathan Copenhaver, as follows. Count one. Battery constituting, constituting domestic violence strangulation, ferret cage. Guilty of battery constituting, constituting domestic violence. Court, count two, coercion. Guilty of coercion without force. Count three, preventing or dissuading witness or victim from reporting crime or commencing prosecution. Guilty of preventing or dissuading witness of or victim from reporting crime or commencing prosecution. The jury deadlocked on the two counts of attempted murder, but Copenhaver was still convicted on 29 others, including kidnapping and sexual assault with a weapon. He was sentenced on June 5, 2017. Erin McAday and her daughter, Christy McAday, both made brief statements before the sentencing of Jonathan Copenhaver, the 35-year-old mixed martial arts fighter known as War Machine. I don't know if my life will feel complete in 12 years, or 20 years, or even 30 years, and neither do you. I have to look out for the uh, well-being of the community and avoid possible danger to future potential victims as I uh, consider the appropriate sentence here. Copenhaver was ordered to serve 36 years to life after being convicted of more than two dozen charges, including sexual assault and first-degree kidnapping. So there you have it. 
36 the rise and fall of John War Machine Copenhaver. It's a human paradox that many of us will only consider the big picture once it's already too late. He will more than likely spend the rest of his life in prison, and Good. in reverse to the wonder of being able to create memories in the future, he now has to make do with the ones he's got. The mountaintops and the valleys. Only the mountains will never have seemed as high, and the valleys won't appear nearly as deep. Jeez, man. What an absolute motherfucker, dude. <sighs> that one was a lot more intense than I thought it was going to be, so I do apologize. What an absolute loser. I doubt he has parole. I don't know.